What do we think? Should we get started? I'd go for it. All right, let's do it. Can everyone see this? Does it look okay? You're good. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining and welcome to our first day of the uh, IAB M10 workshop, which uh, stands for the Management Techniques in Encrypted Networks. Uh, on behalf of everyone on the IAB who is helping to arrange this, uh, we're excited to have you all here and we appreciate all of your contributions that you've been making. Um, as one point of order to note, this is uh, being recorded and the other sessions will be recorded as well. And these are planned to be posted to YouTube. Um, if there are any concerns or issues with that, please let us know. So first I'd like to kick off the workshop with a reminder of what the topics are and some of the questions that we raised in the initial call for work. So the goal we have is to explore this interaction between network management and traffic encryption. Um, that's the end-to-end -end encryption that's being used to protect user data and user privacy. And we want to see if through this discussion and this exploration, we can initiate new work on specifically collaborative approaches that can promote security and user privacy while also supporting and enabling operational requirements that networks may have. And the three questions that we raised in the call that uh, hopefully we'll find some interesting discussion on, if not necessarily answers for, are first, what are actionable network management requirements? So what are the things that networks want to do in managing that are you know not broad oh we need to see all the bits but practically what are goals that we think people can agree on and um that we can see being viable uh, having viable pass forward in encrypted networks second who is willing to work on collaborative solutions so what are the incentives for different parties to participate in this and then what are some of the starting points we can imagine for building collaborative solutions in standards and also actually getting them deployed? To structure the discussion, we have three days and we've generally grouped these um, into the topics of where we are. So the state of things for network management and encryption, um, not looking at what are kind of the next steps yet. That will be today. Tomorrow we'll go over some of the principles and ideas of where we want to go. And then on the third day, we're gonna talk about um, some of the proposals that we've gotten uh, in the contributions for ideas of directions or practical next steps on how we increase collaboration for network management and encrypted traffic. And for each of these, we'll start out with about half of the session being presentations of some of the work that was contributed. And then the second half will be open discussion uh, that anyone will be able to contribute to. So I'll, I'll go into just the agenda for today. I'm Tommy Polly. I'm chairing this session. So first, we're going to have two talks that are talking more about the state of network measurement and traffic classification. And so for each of these, we'll have about 15 minutes of presentation, followed by five minutes of discussion and questions. Then we'll uh, have a presentation uh, from an invited talk uh, from Lauren van, der Be van Bever um, on uh, the current state of some of the uh, techniques we have for preventing traffic analysis or more like what what are the extreme angles of how we can encrypt and prevent networks from learning too much user information and then mallory will take us through some of the uh state and current thoughts about uh, user privacy and how it interacts with safe measurement on the internet and then for the rest of the session we'll have open discussion 
from a practical standpoint, uh, we are using WebEx. And so I'd like to propose that as we are doing uh, questions and queuing, if people could use the WebEx chat, do like a plus queue in there, and then we can manage the queue that way. All right. Any other things uh, I missed or we should cover before we get going? All right. So I think we're going to start out with Chase. Hey, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Um, do you want to present your own slides or should I present it here? Uh, you can present it. Yeah. Um, okay, which just just say me? next slide and I'll go ahead. Okay, sounds good. Uh, okay, uh, hello everyone. My name is Chase. Um, so I'll be talking about how to design robust and efficient classifiers for uh, encrypted network traffic in the modern internet, especially going over some of the challenges associated with it and how um, explore how, how do we explore some potential directions that we can uh, we can move towards. So if you want to go to the next slide. So uh, as we all know, um, network traffic classification is a fairly common uh, network management task. So that usually involves inferring uh, services and applications, right? And efficiently and accurately class the key component to allow network uh, operators to perform a fairly wide range of essential tasks, such as uh, capacity resource planning, QoS monitoring, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some conventional approaches to traffic classification, which often uses network features that are, are uh, hand extracted from expert knowledge. But more recently, uh, people are trying to use machine learning to perform classification that has both classical learning based as well as uh, deep learning based methods. And these methods have generally performed quite well when they are applied to uh, curated data sets and when they are evaluated in very specific contexts. And they have frequently depended on uh, domain, specific, domain specific features, such as uh, IP addresses and information that is readily available in, um, say, the I encrypted packet payloads. Um, however, um, given the rise of network traffic uh, encryption, um, the effectiveness of such long established network classifiers methods uh, are may, longer, may no longer be available. And in this position paper, we look at some of the challenges associated with designing uh, classifiers that are robust and efficient against uh, pervasive encryption of the traffic. And we also suggest some possible uh, research directions to look into. Uh, if you want to go to the next one. Great. So one of the things that we are looking at is that why are current uh, encrypted traffic classifiers not enough. So first thing of all, uh, um, the increasing utilization of different uh, network tr uh, traffic encryption schemes, they tend to alter the feature space of machine learning based classifiers. This is through first uh, reducing the usefulness of uh, import a feature uh, of the effective features. It's just inherently some of the features are becoming encrypted and they are no longer providing sufficient information to the uh, classifiers. Second is that the feature importance distribution is shifting itself as well. And the majority of the existing classifiers that attempt to address these issues is to rely on complex uh, deep learning based models to avoid manually articulating informative features. Um, but unlike traditional methods that are heuristic based or uh, classical machine learning based, uh, which usually depend on a few uh, selected components of the traffic flows, these deep learning models often learn um, representation of the traffic from very long, lengthy network traffic inputs, such as uh, the entirety of packet headers. Um, this is to make traffic classification uh, decision accurately. But the drawback is that in a real world deployment setting, such as a uh, ISP, capturing and storing large portions of the traffic flow on a large scale can introduce very high overheads in terms of uh, system costs as well as uh, inference cost. Moreover, it's uh, very crucial for network operators to make classification decisions quickly enough so that the appropriate follow-up actions can be taken. And consider a broad set of network traffic features 
it can very much slow down the infra speed of such classifiers, which actually first uh, reduces the efficiency. Um, next slide. Um, so while um, most of the existing classifiers designed for uh, encrypted network traffic classifiers, um, they do show promising results when they are evaluated with closed world data sets. Uh, these classifiers, uh, they often fail to uh, remain robust when they are given your network traffic received at a different location or time uh, across different domains. And this is largely because the heterogeneity and involvement of network infrastructure. Uh, if you look at the installation of new equipments, there's new uh, software updates or increasing uh, amount of end hosts in the network. And to look at this issue, we conduct a sample study to collect TRS encrypted traffic across a wide range of applications at two different locations and times. And we split it, the collected traffic into two different data sets, the old one and the new one. Um, our results show that um, while we can train a simple ML-based traffic classifier to perform really well with a F1 score like near 99% on one of the data on the old data set, the performance of the classifier degrades severely uh, when applied directly to the new data set, even though both data sets contain traffic from the same set of applications. More generally speaking, while a lot of the existing encrypted traffic classifiers are, are evaluated using uh, well-known data sets, uh, we are talking about the, for example, the ISCX uh, VPN non VPN data set and the uh, UNIPS uh, data set. These classifiers are not necessarily robust when they are transferred to new data sets or environments because closed world data sets are not necessarily sufficient to describe what the most up to date internet traffic actually looks like. Uh, if you want to move on to the next one. So, while deep learning based approaches uh, appear to be the mainstream approach for uh, designing classifiers for encrypted network traffic, we found that. We can utilize uh, non uh, black box models. We are talking about classical machine learning mo uh, methods like decision trees or interpretable machine learning techniques. Um, we are, for example, the permutation based importance, uh, importance based on SHAP to reduce the amount of features to consider while we can obtain reasonably good classification results. This reduces the feature space while maintaining the classification accuracy can uh, effectively lower the relevant uh, system cost for classifier uh, implementers because they need to preserve less traffic now uh, compared to before. And a plausible way to reduce the feature space is to rank uh, network level features according to the feature importance as interpreted by the model and uh, choose to neglect features that are less informative or have sometimes negative impact on the classifier performance. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. So we evaluated this using some of the prominent data sets. So this includes the quick data set uh, that we obtained and then the ISX uh, VPN and VMP, VPN data sets. And we also collect a Are other people getting choppy audio? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Um. Chase, uh, okay, we can see you now. Um, we lost your audio for pretty much all of this slide. Could uh, we try going over that again? And maybe, maybe, maybe you want to turn off video for a moment or something. Um, okay, uh, can you hear me now, or is it stupid? I can, I, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, so it's is, is just this slide. Yeah, just this slide. If you just start at the beginning again for that. Yeah, sounds good. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, so essentially, we are trying to evaluate uh, our previous claim of. Uh, 
you can just use a few features features compared to like what most deep learning model use the entire uh, entire um, bitstream of the flow is that we evaluate this using very prominent uh, data sets, including um, the quick data set, the ICX VPN and VPN data set. And we also collect our own TLS encrypted traffic flows, which uh, include a bunch of uh, video streaming, video conferencing, and social media applications. And our results here show that we can arrive at relatively similar performance when providing the models with just the top few features. And we are talking about the packet header fields. And compared to just using all of the features, uh, at the same time, we observe a very big reduction in inference time needed to arrive at the classification decisions because um, there are fewer features to be considered, so we have fewer matrix modifications. Um, yeah. Next slide. So um, the, th the second thing that we are considering is that while training and evaluating models based on a single closed world data set can lead to classifiers that are no, not robust in terms of um, model transferability, we can try to identify features that remain consistently robust across data sets and exploit these features when designing classifiers. Um, here we design a set of uh, we define a set of features to be robust is that when models train and validate it using this set of features can achieve similar performance when they are tested on a new data set that has never seen before. And one reasonable, uh, one reasonable way to obtain this set of features is through statistical analysis or comparison across data sets and finding network level features that, are, that have relatively consistent uh, values and distributions for predicting each uh, application services across the data set. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so here we give an example of the like uh, possible way to do this kind of analysis by computing the JS based uh, JS test based GIF score across two data sets on a header field level. So on the uh, on the so here we use the unprint encoder, which encodes the um, the raw PCAP on a bit level. And then we aggregate the bit level into the uh, field level um, uh, through either mean or sum, um, through either uh, yeah the mean or the max. Um, so providing the model with this set of robust features, look uh, according to the GIF score, allows us to avoid context specific features that are overfitted to a particular data set, which can be easily rendered less effective when the model is given new instances of traffic generated in a different network uh, environment across domain. Um, yeah, if you go on the next slide. And to wrap up things, um, uh, the conclusion that we obtain is that although the topic of uh, encrypted traffic classification has been extensively studied, uh, we point out that there are still room for improvement because existing classifiers lack efficiency for practical deployment and uh, experience low model transferability. And based on the observations that we made, we present an opportunity for the network research community to re-examine this uh, space and attempt to develop new methods for traffic classification that are robust in the face of encryption and more accurate uh, and efficient uh, for real deployment. And yeah, that's most, I think that's most of it. And uh, if you go to the next slide, that's, I think it says Q&A. All right, thank you. Um, so what we're going to do is have five minute uh, questions after each of these talks. So if anyone has questions here, um, please drop a Q plus or something into the chat. Uh, or we can, I, I see some people raising their hand, but yeah, let's use the Q plus. Uh, Wes. Please go ahead. Oh, thanks, Chase, for the good uh, presentation. It, it aligns well with sort of my own research results. Um, have you studied sort of the temporal drop off of, of approaches and how long they last? As uh, you sort of you hinted at at you know issues with them lasting for a while, but do you have any sort of notion for how long a particular technique is you know valid for before traffic starts changing so much or applications change so much that, that the training no longer works? So, like, what we find is that, like. There, like essentially, there's two scenarios, right? One is like you train model and you try to expect the model to last as long as possible without retraining, right? Given that you you train your weight on you train your weights on the features, 
And then the second scenario is like if you if you consider retraining to have a low cost, but you have a pre-selected set of features, and then you retrain based on that set of features. How long does it take for that set of features to become less informative? And we find that so we, we essentially we have data set of like over a year of span, and we find that like even across two data sets that are a week apart, if you just train a model and then use the exactly identical model to infer infer application on a different data set, the, you, you are getting somewhat like a 50%, no better than random guessing performance. However, the set of features tend to stay relatively robust across time, with a few features that are becoming less informative. And yeah, so it really depends like on in the context where you whether your retraining is costly or not. Right. If you if you're talking about model aging uh on uh on, on yeah, without retraining, then yes, uh the, the aging part is not very well. Um but then if, if if you consider retraining to not be a big problem, then yeah, yeah. All right. Uh next up, uh Michael. So uh, hi, Chase. Michael Collins here. Um, fascinating talk. I've got a question for you that's sort of been bothering me for a long time, thinking about statistical training uh, or statistical processes on network data. And I think the question I'm really dealing with is what have you thought much about how much precision we can realistically get out of any of these models? Because I sometimes feel that we're uh, that we might be better served by saying we can only get this very rough level and then decide what kind of actions we can take based on those rough levels of precision. Um, so, like, when we evaluate models based on just one closed world data set, and then we try to back, like, so, for example, if we try the uh, uh, gradient boosting machine on, on one particular data set, we can arrive at something for, like, 99 percent accuracy right like and if you look at some of the machine learning de deep learning models they, they achieve similar performance high in the 99 percentiles and like every new paper says so we, we like we, we increment a little bit but the thing is that when you apply to when, when you apply it to real world deployment unless you have a very close network that has no variations for, for example in end, end hosts you have a set of end hosts and then that you can essentially just learn ip 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 endpoints are but then, like in real deployment, um, there's variation in performance. You can't for really provide a guarantee on how much of a good performance you can get. But on a relatively, like if 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 your network doesn't vary that much, you you can get indeed get into the high eighties and high nineties. And and this even surprisingly, this even applies to quick and VPN traffic. Um, if you look at ICS VPN traffic, we can get somewhat like 85% accuracy uh, just using a simple uh, gradient boosting machine. And for quick traffic, you can get into the high 90s. Um, yeah. Thanks. All right. Um, Richard, and then I think we'll move on after that question. Hi, Chase. Thanks for this talk. I, I find this, uh, so I, I kind of come from the application or security side of, of the world. And so I find these talks really interesting because it talks about how leaky our uh, application or security properties are because they're leaking all this information that you guys can pick up. Um, can you chat for a moment about kind of what the broader context for, for this, these classification tasks are? Like why from a network management point of view, do I care about classifying traffic this way? What are the uses for this storage classification? Kind of what, what are the harms that would arise if, you know, uh, the application or the encryption were, were updated so that these uh, sorts of classifications approaches became even less uh, effective? Yes, I mean, we, like, I think there has been like a lot of literature talking about like, why, why do we care about this kind of traffic classification? And, you know, looking at things like, Resource planning, capacity planning, when like, and at, at the same time, you like to consider quality of service monitoring, right? And traffic prioritization, for example, there are certain traffic that are more like, uh, say, for, for example, there, there's a difference between the prioritization of video streaming traffic, video conferencing traffic, and then say, for example, you're just browsing on the web, right? Uh, there are traffic that are inherently more uh, relate, like more, they, they rely more on the latency of the traffic. Right, then you, you tend to like if if I can correctly infer that your traffic is um, you're you're having a Zoom call, I can prioritize that traffic to make sure that you get minimized latency that you are receiving, right? 
And with the increasing level of encryption, so for example, DNS is getting encrypted. Uh, for example, if you, if you use the uh, encrypt, the more encrypted uh, TLS, or if you're just using VPN, how hard is it for ISP to infer your traffic to be video conferencing and then try to actually prioritize your traffic, right? And then you can also have uh, applications say malicious traffic detection and then and that et cetera, et cetera. So anything really related to you, you try to isolate traffic into different flows and then do something subjective about them individually. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, Chase. Um, and next, uh, I believe, Chin, are you going to be covering this? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, do, do you want me to click through the slides again, or do you want to present? Uh, yeah, you present for me. Yeah, that's okay. okay. Yeah, that's thank fine. you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Qingwu. Uh, the topic I want to introduce is network management of encrypted traffic. So, uh, so traffic encryption trend, actually, our position is detected, don't decrypt it. Next. Uh, to begin uh, this uh, discussion, I'm, I want to set some uh, context for this talk. Uh, so as we know, actually, uh, IETF developed a bunch of protocols at the network level, uh, transport layer, uh, and the application layer. Uh, and uh, this protocol has been enriched uh, with many security features. And uh, for example, uh, RBSEC at the layer three, uh, TRS Quick at the layer four, HDB at the layer uh, seven, and uh, in the meanwhile, actually also developed a MacSec uh, to provide uh, confidentiality and authentication encryption. And um, also we see the trend is uh, user privacy security, you know, uh, draw a lot of attention, uh, attention in ITF, for, for example, PPM, uh, uh, privacy pr uh, preservation uh, management, uh, Oblivious uh, uh, HTTP, Oblivious uh, DNS, and uh, MASQ, etc. Next. So the traffic uh, actually, uh, you can see actually, uh, are encrypted at uh, different layers. Uh, so in this uh, picture, we also uh, provide example of traffic encryption at the Mac layer and the Wi-Fi NIC layer. So in all of these examples, uh, fields in the uh, packet format for each layer in red are uh, encryption part. And all I, uh, one observation we have is at the network layer, we have RPSEC, but RPSEC or ESP only provide encryption. Uh, uh, but for RPSEC uh, AH, actually, they provide uh, authentication, doesn't provide encryption. Next. So uh, for traffic encryption trend, we all know this actually, there's two break points actually, the first is in 2006, TRS 1.1 uh, uh, was introduced actually, so we can provide traffic encryption for uh, application data for uh, TRS payload. Uh, the second break point is TRS uh, 1.3, get introduced, get published, and we can pro provide a fully uh, encryption not only for Packet header, but also for uh, packet payload. Next. So uh, dive uh, deeper into the traffic encryption at the different layers. So we can see the commonality uh, for RPSEC, MACSEC, WPA. They actually they can uh, allow the uh, traffic communication uh, between uh, network to network or between the device to device in the network. But the TRS and uh, and uh, Quick, uh, they can provide uh, uh, traffic communication between the endpoint to endpoint or between host to host in the end to end manner. Uh, secondly, actually, uh, security protocols has uh, actually uh, they uh, you know more uh, rely on the uh, cryptographic uh, uh, innovation or progress. Uh, for example, uh, you can see the TRS 1.3 actually, they introduce uh, a lot of uh, good security feature. They provide more secure uh, crypto suits. Um, next. 
So here we actually gave the network management standards overview. In this overview, you can see network management standards span across uh, the whole si uh, life cycle of service management and device management. For example, from the device onboarding, bootstrapping to uh, uh, IP address management uh, to the DNS name uh, resolu resolution from the network access control to the AAA management uh, and the identity management uh, from the network configuration uh, protocols such as NetConf to network uh, monitoring such as uh, uh, telemetry, RPFix, uh, syslog. They also cover uh, network maintenance, uh, troubleshooting using OEM tools, uh, mechanism protocols. Next. So for network monitoring, actually, uh, uh, this can be classified into the passive monitoring and uh, active monitoring. So typical uh, example of active monitoring is the TWAMP and the PPM. They actually allow you to establish a dedicated control channel to initiate a management results. Uh, network monitoring can also be classified into the pool based mechanism and a push based mechanism. Pool based uh, mechanism actually is more related to the pooling based uh, mechanism. It represents the slow speed uh, management interface for push based mechanism more uh, you know, represent the high speed uh, management interface. Next. So we have so many network management standards. So which protocol uh, are impacted, which protocol are not impacted? So based on our observation, we can see actually AAA protocol, uh, especially accounting, security management, QS management, network access control, uh, actually uh, impact a, a lot about this uh, uh, traffic encryption. In addition, actually traffic uh, management such as uh, PPM or RP fix also get a, uh, a little bit of impact, but not a bigger concern. And we think actually AI-based network management actually could, could serve the, a good solution to deal with this uh, traffic encryption uh, uh, challenge. So we list uh, several challenges. I think the previous talk already covered this, uh, you know, AI-based network management. So I want don't don't want to uh, go into deep to discuss this. And uh, next, so um, so since the traffic encryption imposes a greater challenge on the network management, so how network can be managed in support of traffic encryption? So we think actually we have two directions. The first direction is uh, we just uh, you know take what we can get from the networker. We can rely on the network management plan. The second is that we can you know. Uh, encouraging more collaboration uh, with the user and a, a service provider from the intermediate proxy perspective. For the first uh, uh, direction, uh, we actually need to uh, acquire a lot of metadata from the uh, networker and use this metadata combined with the AI uh, machine learning uh, mechanism. Uh, we can, you know, uh, to do the traffic classification, application identification. So uh, I think our position is that we think uh, DPI is not uh, recommended and uh, uh, also we think uh, you don't need to decrypt the traffic uh, when you use this kind of network management mechanism. So AI uh, can be played a key role in this uh, kind of network management solution. For uh, the second direction, you need to more uh, uh, encourage more collaboration uh, between the network community and the application community. Uh, next. So for the first direction, we think uh, to support this AI-based uh, network management, actually the important part is uh, to get the metadata. So metadata actually re represent the traffic characteristics. Uh, for example, it will record what, when, and where, whom of the network communication. So this matter, uh, metadata can be captured from the packet head header, and also it can uh, capture using outband mechanism. And uh, actually this metadata can be the session level, packet level, or flow level. It can also can be captured uh, indirectly from the host. Uh, next. So here we show actually um, uh, how uh, AI-based network management works actually. So you get the metadata, you process the metadata, and, and then you can use AI-based mechanism to uh, classify the traffic and, uh, uh, and uh, to identify the application, but uh, application uh, 
identification or traffic classification is not the end. Actually, you can further use uh, this uh, 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 identified application to for uh, to to do the QS management or security management, for example, to, to detect uh, the malicious uh, traffic. Next. So uh, here we uh, also give another example of the collab collaboration method. So in this uh, uh, use case, actually, this is more related to the TLS-based uh, traffic identification. Identification. So in this case, is TLS one dot three or encrypted uh, client hello will be used. So it's hard to capture, you know, unencrypted uh, metadata such as uh, uh, crypto suits or TLS version or uh, uh, client the public key names. Uh, so uh, how how do we you know get this unencrypted data? So collaboration uh, method can be used. So either you can collaborate between the user device and the intermediate uh, proxy, or you can establish a collaboration between the intermediate proxy and a server in the cloud. In both cases, you need to establish the trust relationship uh, between the intermediate proxy and with the, the other end. Uh, in both cases, actually, you can use uh, certificate management uh, to uh, help to establish such kind of trust relationship. So here we just uh, give the uh, example. Uh, next. So uh, I, I like to uh, conclude my discussion here. Actually, I, I think we have two takeaway. I, I think uh, uh, first is, uh, you know, we can, you know, use AI-based network management and mechanism to deal with uh, traffic encryption. I think this is uh, the best choice uh, and uh, it will keep it involved actually. Uh, and uh, so uh, one thing we can think about whether this need to be standard in the IETF or in IETF, I think uh, uh, could be actually developed architecture for AI-based network management on encrypted traffic. And uh, uh, the, the second taking away actually, I think, uh, you know, face this uh, uh, too many impact or challenge, actually we have also have a lot of opportunities. So uh, for for example, for network access control management, actually usually we will, you know, use IP-based access control provider, you know, uh, cost granularity access control, but it can be further involved to uh, support policy-based access control uh, um, also, uh, to support these kind of cases, actually, AAA protocol can be, you know, extend to uh, to carry the ACL attribute or user control list attribute. Uh, for network security management, actually, we can see actually there's some work ongoing in ITL, especially in OPSWG called TLS Smart. Actually, they can, you know, uh, define the TLS provider for malware traffic detection. Um, and uh, the, the last actually is network application collaboration. I think uh, here we just uh, gave an example. I think uh, this may be uh, worth uh, more exploration to uh, find more use cases, come up with a uh, generic solution. So uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. All right, thank you. Um, we have time for a couple of questions if people want to queue. See, Colin's pointing out that M NMRG has already been discussing this. Yeah, uh, I think I haven't discussed. I think uh, last time actually, I, I see this uh, uh, NMRG chair actually reported to the I IAB and about this, and uh, there's some suggestion for this. But I, I, I think potentially this can be, you know, be discussed in NMRG further cook and see whether this need needed to 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 deal with this. Uh, Challenge. Yeah, NMRG has quite a long document talking about this, and they've been discussing it on and off for that for several months now. So yeah, there's definitely interest in that group. Yeah, uh, Torless. Yeah, is there an idea of how much you know encrypted network management traffic itself can be analyzed? Because I'm looking at you know things like routing protocols or others. Where maybe I can see more or less, but I wouldn't know how much how much more could be seen from AI side. So it would be very interesting. Yeah, uh, I I think uh, for uh, this actually I I compare you know network layer security with uh, transport layer security. I see actually more innovation in the transport layer. Uh, but IPsec actually also 
there has to be uh, you know a developer and uh, has uh, several iteration uh, to add a more feature but uh, not a uh, you know innovator than the transport layer security i think rpsec is a good example actually uh, uh, but for routing protocol actually i i'm not sure currently actually what i heard actually they may uh, discuss you know use uh, like a, a tcp uh, md5 and uh, tcp ao and uh, maybe consider to involve some routing protocol toward a TRS 1.3. This uh, actually, there's some ongoing discussion in PC working group. But uh, uh, currently, actually, uh, this, uh, uh, I think a routing protocol maybe need to be uh, further involved, I mean, uh, uh, to support this kind of security. All right, um, I don't see anyone else queued up in the chat. So I think we'll move on in the interest of time. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And now we're going to take a uh, different angle. So those first few talks were covering uh, essentially you know, the efforts around trying to classify or detect um, traffic. Uh, even with encryption and kind of where those efforts are currently going. Now uh, we'll have a very different angle of talking about how do we make sure that uh, traffic can be better obfuscated and better protected. Um, see kind of the other end of this arms race here. So uh, Lauren, do you want to yeah. Take us through this, and, and you can feel free to share if you would like. Yeah, as well, if, if you don't like, um, please. All right. Do you see the screen? We do. All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So now for something completely different. Uh, so indeed, what I would like to speak about is a little bit how we can prevent traffic analysis of encrypted traffic and doing so in a way that uh, doesn't hamper uh, performance too much or ideally at all. So um, in a nutshell, what we leverage here, just to give you the gist, is this new next generation of programmable uh, data planes, programmable hardware, that allows us to nowadays do obfuscation at very high speed. So I don't need to motivate this to this crowd. Uh, we already had uh, several discussions on that uh, in the last few minutes. But even if the traffic is encrypted, as you know, uh, attackers like man in the middle looking at your traffic can figure out a lot of interesting properties about it. So, for instance, there's been a lot of work in this space showing, for instance, that people can infer which video somebody is watching, the characteristic of the endpoints, what, what type of endpoints, what operating systems is running, what kind of applications are running, the version numbers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is a flurry there of attacks um, that I won't go into. A few ones that uh, I always find, let's say, surprising still, for instance, is like the attacks on, on VoIP traffic, being able to figure out even uh, if you are speaking French or English in an encrypted communication, for instance, or whether given words are being pronounced in a conversation. So all of these are, are possible and have been shown uh, in the past. So what, we, what we've been looking at in, in this work is uh, what about other, so we know this, this problem is, is true, of course, in the internet. What about other um, contexts in which uh, this problem happens? And what we realize is that, for instance, wide area networks, this problem happens as well. So um, the wide area networks, what I mean by this, are these large scale, sometimes planet reaching networks that interconnect, for instance, large scale uh, centers. So the kind of network that Google, uh, Microsoft, Amazon is running in between their uh, centers, for instance. And in these networks, what you have is you have, of course, like uh, fibers that are interconnecting these different sites. And these fibers, by design, they have to cross a very large spanning uh, geographical region, for instance, that cross ocean. And this means that it's very hard to secure this network. So it's very hard to prevent tampering and also people tapping onto these fibers. And that's been shown again in the past. So that's kind of like the kind of like um, specific application domain I mean, network context that we have been considering. And of course, it goes without saying that in these wide area networking, these ones uh, you tend to see very high throughput lengths, north of hundreds of, of even 400 gig lengths. 
So of course, one operator is already aware of this problem. So for instance, you can see here uh, two screenshots from uh, Microsoft Azure and in Amazon AWS. So these um, entities are actually encrypting all the traffic in between the data centers. So even though it's their private network, right, they own the physical infrastructure, they are using dark fibers, they are also um, very worried about possible tampering of their, uh, of their fibers and in order to prevent uh, analysis, the, the encrypted traffic. And of course, as I've said, uh, encrypting is not enough and traffic analysis is still possible. So if you think about traffic analysis prevention systems, the kind of challenges that apply there, uh, we see three of them. Of course, the first one and the most important one is the uh, security. Uh, so you want, when you are obfuscating your traffic, you would like to get some security guarantees out of that. Uh, ideally, especially in the case of the one, you would like high performance. So you would like your obfuscation technique to be able to run at hundreds of gigs per second without impacting the production traffic. And of course, ideally, you would like the deployability aspect. So you would like to be able to deploy these obfuscation techniques without having to change every single end system, for instance, in your, um, in your infrastructure. So the system that I will, I will speak about in, in the next few minutes is called DITO and kind of like fulfills these three properties. So DITO provides high security guarantees um, in the sense that the traffic, obfuscated traffic that DITO produces does not contain any more information. So um, the traffic is completely independent from the input traffic. The obfuscated traffic, the output of DITO completely independent from the input traffic. It runs at very high speed and it does so by minimizing the overhead. And here I will speak about how we minimize the overhead of obfuscation. Of course, there is an overhead. But the good thing for us is that we can actually do the obfuscation now in hardware by leveraging, as I said, this new next generation of line cards that become programmable. So there have been a lot of work here on uh, traffic obfuscation. I'm only mentioning a few here on these slides, but you can, uh, but you can see them. And these works, the, I mean, they are great, they are very useful, but they tend to fail one or many of the properties I've just mentioned. So for instance, in the case of security, they might not protect all the, uh, all the attacks, which is of course a problem. They might not work at high throughput, giving you only a few megabits or best case, few gigabits per second. And in many cases, they are hard to deploy because they require end-host support, uh, which would be problematic, for instance, again, in the case of a cloud provider. So how does DITO work? Well, we, we kind of like uh, deploy our solution at the edge of, um, of the one. So you can see here the edge switch that interconnects these different sites together. We deploy DITO enabled switches there, so programmable switches. And then DITO switches will actually protect the traffic that goes alongside the one links. So all these links will now be protected, meaning that um, an attacker tapping on them should not be able to infer anything about the traffic. So what properties do we provide? We provide three of them. The first one is volume anonymity. So here the idea is that the attacker looking at detailed obfuscated traffic should not be able to infer anything about the size of the packets or the flows of the real traffic. We also provide timing anonymity. So again, an attacker should not be able to infer anything about the timing of the packets uh, that have been um, I mean, created by the endpoints. And of course, the attacker should also not be able to track the packets across multiple links. So that's what we call pass anonymity. Uh, it should be impossible for the attacker to know that your packet is the same, for instance, across multiple links. So in order to do that, we use a very classical technique, I must say. So there is, um, it's not like the, um, the uh, technique here is radically new. What is, I think, really new is uh, how we actually uh, make it possible. But so if you think about your, your natural traffic here, uh, so this is, for instance, like the uh, traffic that an application like VoIP um, call would generate, like Skype, for instance. So what enables this traffic analysis attack is typically that even in the encrypted traffic, you leak the information about the packet size and then the timing in between packets. So an obvious idea to obfuscate this is just to ensure that uh, the traffic that you send on any link is perfectly constant. For instance, you would have only max size packets and these max size packets will be separated by uh, always exactly the same inter-packet delay. So essentially by, if you can't do that, then you, kind of like leak no more information uh, if you wish, because everything is the same all the time and forever. 
Of course, the question, and this is where uh, the, a lot of the engineering in this paper went into, is how do we um, actually kind of like more the production traffic here uh, on the left hand side of the slide into this constant size traffic that you can see on the right side of the, uh, of the, of the slide. And here, of course, there is an overhead to be paid, and that's kind of like um, something you cannot avoid. You need to, in this case, for instance, you need to make the small packets large, and then also when there is a gap in between two packets uh, that is too big, you need to insert uh, an, another packet in order to, again, make the traffic look perfectly constant. And so here you can see in yellow on the right hand side, the overhead that we have to pay, uh, either in terms of padding or creating essentially fake packets. So here, the trick um, to minimize this overhead is to try to avoid to always obfuscate with max size packets. That would be very wasteful, for instance, if you think about the distribution of the packets being by model, you have like the acts that are very tiny and then the full size packets. So if you have to make all the acts full size, you would pay a big price. So here we are um, actually modulating the traffic according to um, a pattern, which is not always max size packets. And I will explain you how, how we do that a little bit later. And as I said, we do this entirely in the data plane. So um, for those of you who do not know about programmable data planes, you can think about essentially a new next generation of line cards that allow uh, to run very simple program onto every single incoming packet um, and modify the forwarding logic of a, of a network device according to these programs. And so this is exactly what we what we learned here. So briefly, what I would like to speak about now in the next three um, three parts of, of the talk would be first, how do we compute this um, efficient pattern uh, briefly? How do we actually shape the traffic according to this pattern in the data plane? And then briefly mentioning you a few experimental reasons. So first for the, uh, the computation of the pattern, here again, if we look at, at the example I was mentioning, so you can see that the overhead is of two types again. Uh, the first one here in red is the padding. So this is the overhead that we have to pay when we take a small packet and we have to make it bigger so that it becomes, for instance, the size uh, of the packet. In this case, it's max, max size. So this is the first type of overhead that we have to pay. The second one, as I said, is the uh, chaff packet. So these fake packets that we have to insert in between the real ones, so the padded ones, so that, again, we keep the constant packet rate. So we want to minimize, essentially, the amount of padding and chaff packets we have to insert um, according to a repeating pattern. And here, the intuition is, is rather simple. So uh, what we want um, is to not have to pay the price too much. Um, again, like small packets to full size packet is a big overhead. So we like, in a sense, to take the input traffic characterization, so the, the traffic distribution in your network, analyze it, and then infer an output pattern that is adapted to your traffic. Uh, here, it's actually quite simple. We just base ourselves on the percentile of the packet size of an input trace that you might have in your network traffic. So of course, here you might wonder, but if you do that, isn't it that you are leaking information to the attacker? And the answer is yes, you are. Um, and so here it's a trade-off, right? So if you don't want to do that, you don't have to, and then you can actually uh, just have a, a pattern, which is always max size packets. Ditto would work as well. Um, but if you ask me, just leaking uh, the information about I mean, the traffic distribution uh, is a very aggregate type of information. And so I think it's, it's actually uh, a relatively uh, okay price to pay in order to uh, minimize your overhead. But again, you're not forced to do that if you don't want to, and you're very concerned about leaking anything, you can avoid this. So, so again, like the way we minimize the overhead is by mapping the input traffic into uh, an optimized patterns, uh, which is repeating itself uh, ad nauseum for eternity. So let me now briefly speak about how do we actually map uh, input traffic into these repeated patterns. So essentially, there are three operations we need to uh, we need to do. The first one is that we need to kind of like delay some packets so that they fit the pattern. Okay, so if we receive a packet a little bit before uh, and the pattern tells us that we have to send that packet in 10 nanoseconds, we need to buffer that packet for 10 nanoseconds in this case. So we have to pay uh, the price in buffering. We also, as I said, we need to pad uh, traffic in order to make it larger, um, again, according to the uh, traffic pattern. Of course, we would like this padding to be minimized. 
and then we have to insert this chaff packet. So here we are inserting packets whenever there is a gap which is too big according to the packet. So these are the three operations that we need to do in detail in order to obfuscate the traffic in perfect way. So at a high level, if you look at the architecture of the data plane that we have built, um, it can be divided into four building blocks. Um, so you have the real packets that arrive on the left-hand side of the slides. First, we insert the chat packets. Then we do the buffering. We delay the packets according to the pattern. We pad the non shaft packets to the right size. We do encryption as well, of course, and then we send all this traffic out. So for the encryption here, I'm assuming that the switch we are uh, running on uh, support encryption, uh, for instance, using MaxSec. So this is like uh, assumptions we make, but there are many production switches that support this. So um, it's, it's reasonable to assume that encryption is taken care of by uh, MaxSec modules. For padding, what we leverage here is um, capabilities of these programmable data planes to add extra information on top of our packets in the form of extra headers. So these are kind of like pieces of, um, of headers that we can slam onto a packet and we can make a packet larger thanks to these extra headers. And these extra headers are fake headers and then they will be encrypted. And so you won't see anything. You will see random, uh, random bits after the encryption. And then, of course, at, towards the end of the data network, we decrypt, remove these uh, fake headers, and then the real packets will get out. For the buffering, what we are using is a simple round-robin scheduler. And this round-robin scheduler will kind of like circle through the different states of the pattern. So, for instance, here you can see on the slides, uh, four states. State with 500 bytes packet, 1,000, and then 1,500 bytes twice. So essentially, each state maps to uh, a queue, and then we just ask the switch to go in round robin uh, throughout this, uh, these queues. So here, what is really important for Dito to work at all is that we can guarantee that there is always a packet in, in all of these queues. Otherwise, the pattern will be broken. We won't actually uh, implement the pattern correctly. And also, we'll start to see on the output link some gaps in between packets. So this is where we do uh, the chat packets insertions in order to ensure this. And as you can see, we kind of use a hierarchical uh, scheduler beam. So we have you, um, here you have the first level of the scheduler and then the second level. Second level. So the second level is round robin, as I mentioned. And the first level, we use uh, priority queues here. And you can see we have kind of like two queues per state. So if you look at this stage, the 500 bytes one, we have these two queues here. And we'll use the highest priority queue for the production traffic that will be mapped to that state. And then we use the lowest priority queue for uh, the chat traffic. And so this chat traffic will be 500 bytes. This chat traffic will be 1,000 bytes, et cetera, et cetera. So what we ensure in detail is that we always have chat packets that are in this, uh, this second priority queues uh, over here. So we always have something to send for any possible state in a pattern, always because of the chat traffic. And then what we also ensure is that whenever we have a production packet to send, we put it in the highest priority queue, ensuring that it will go before, of course, the chat traffic in order to minimize the end-to-end -end For the chat traffic, we use actually the um, capabilities of the switch to generate and recirculate traffic. Um, so each switch has some ports that are dedicated to recirculation, and we use that to actually uh, create fake traffic of the right size that we kind of like loop inside the switch in order to ensure that we always have these chat packets around. And these um, packets, if in case you wonder, can also be generated in, now in hardware directly by the switch. You don't need software necessarily to do that. That's actually new in, in uh, the new generation of these switches. So as I said, the entire thing runs into the data plane directly. So you can actually take this and then load into uh, network device that can run um, at technically hundreds of gigs per port. So this is kind of like the, um, the pipeline that you see on single devices. So in terms of the property that we uh, provide, again, we provide volume anonymity, timing anonymity, and pass anonymity. So how do we provide volume anonymity? Well, we guarantee, as I said, that the traffic will follow the pattern all the time. So the volume, if you wish, will be constant. The rate of the packets will be uh, the same all the time and forever. In case of timing anonymity, well, we guarantee the absence of any timing links because we blast the link at full speed all the time. 
So we, we send the traffic at a fixed rate, and if the output link is a 100 gig link, we will send 100 gig of traffic over the time. This is, of course, not great for uh, in the context of energy consumption. So that's something we are well aware of. Perhaps ironically, though, uh, the, the existing devices are not great at, um, let's say, uh, consuming less when there is no traffic and consuming more only when there is a lot of traffic. So what we, are, what we have realized when we did measurement here is that whether we send a lot of traffic or almost nothing, the consumption of the device almost does not change. So here, even though there is an overhead in terms of the traffic, there is not a huge overhead in terms of the energy. That said, I really wish that um, there will be a lot of progress in the coming years on reducing the uh, consumption of network devices. In terms of the pass anonymity, how do we do that? Well, we encrypt the traffic on a per link basis. Um, so this prevents the uh, attacker from like kind of like mapping packets that are like the same on different links, just because this, the encryption would be uh, different. All right, a few words now about the experimental results. Uh, so we actually uh, developed that and we um, launched, we kind of like loaded that on, uh, on real hardware. So you can see here on the, on the right hand side, it's a picture of our lab. So it's composed oops, of around, uh, as of now, eight uh, programmable switches. We use Intel Tofino switches here. Um, and we also run um, Dito on uh, simulations in software so that we can uh, kind of like study the potentials for new hardware features and how they can improve uh, Dito. So one experiment I, I will briefly mention is how much, of course, throughput Dito can achieve, which is probably the, the most uh, the most pressing ones that, that everyone has in the back of his or her head. So you can see like traffic entering here, and the question is how much obfuscated traffic we can get out uh, on per basis. So here you can see the um, evolution of the output rate, so how much obfuscated traffic we're able to produce as a function of the input rate, input rate between 0 and 100 gig. So ideally, um, there will be uh, the traffic of Dito will follow this line, which just means that uh, we are kind of like have no overhead whatsoever. Okay, so if I send 10, 10 gig of production traffic, and then I get 10 gig out of obfuscated traffic. So of course, um, we have an overhead, so it's not like we can send um, 100 gig without without any overhead, right? We have to do this padding, we have to do this chat traffic uh, insertion, so we do pay an overhead. But as you can see, we are almost ideal up to 60 gig per link. So this is the point where the curve starts to um, well, essentially decrease uh, a little bit. And that's because at that point, we start to pay the price of, uh, of uh, the chaff and the padding. But you can see if you send 100 gig in, we still manage to get 80 gig out. So of course, we are working now on how we can make this curve look as ideal as possible and try to push the boundary here uh, on, on the right hand side as much as possible. But still, I mean, up to 60 gig, there is uh, no, um, no effect whatsoever uh, on, the, on the production traffic, which is, um, which is actually, I think, quite good, uh, again, on the per port basis. We also perform experiments in the paper um, on, the, on the applications. Uh, so we, we run real traffic through this. Uh, of course, there is uh, perhaps some of you are asking questions about reordering. So that's, these are like um, aspects that can happen, of course, because we are making some packets wait. So we, want, we were, of course, um, worried about this and then we measured that. And we saw no essentially um, insane effects on the application performance again up to a given point because at some point again the uh, the overhead is starting to kick in and then we start to see an increase in the performance but still it's a relatively um, uh, modest increase and of course one he here can tune the uh, the system in order to um, to reduce that overhead according to his or her traffic so for instance here you can see that there was no effect on the website's load up to 60 gig per second and after that we start to see an increase up to uh, half a second when we send 100 gig of traffic inside. You can see here that we were using a pattern of length six. So a pattern was composed of six packets. And if we are using different patterns, we really have an impact on the performance. As you can see here, we have a pattern of length three only, and here a pattern of length one, which is the equivalent of just max size packets I was mentioning. So having a pattern which is optimized really pays off and really helps. All right, so that's it. I hope I wasn't too long, but 
just to summarize what uh, DITO is, DITO is a system which um, can obfuscate traffic directly in hardware in the line card, provides strong security guarantee because it makes the obfuscated traffic completely independent from the production traffic. It provides high performance, again, because it runs in the hardware. It also minimizes the overhead, thanks to these optimized patterns that I've mentioned. And it's deployable. So these devices, you can buy them today. Some network providers, um, they have them already. So it's not like I'm talking about, uh, I don't know, like a new ASICs that might hit the market in, uh, in 10 years from now. So you can really try to do these things uh, today. If you are interested, uh, I would just uh, perhaps refer you to our uh, GitHub repo, where we put all the code, including for the, uh, the hardware switch. Uh, everything is, is open and, uh, and, and available over there. And we have plenty of more details, again, in the paper. Uh, you can find the paper online. And I need to acknowledge my PhD student here, who, uh, who I wish uh, could have given this talk. Uh, he's just, just graduated and now he's on holidays. So um, you're, you're stuck with me instead. But hopefully I can do uh, him justice and answer some questions. With this, thanks. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Um, we definitely have a lot going on in the chat. Um, I, I think there are some questions that are a little bit earlier, um, I believe, first from Torless and then Wes. Um, I think I didn't catch which programmable um, forwarding plane you were using. If this is something like P4 or so, yeah. I'd be uh, interested because uh, I haven't seen the operation of uh, you know modifying packet payload concatenating packets or so at line rate. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. you're right. I didn't mention that. So that's a good question. So uh, it's indeed P4, uh, P4 based. Uh, so we use um, a P4 program to obfuscate the traffic and the uh, hardware we tested this program on is an Intel Tofino. And as I said, the way we, for instance, make the packet bigger is by abusing uh, one of the P4 features, which allows you to add extra header on top of your packet. So this is, by the way, a limitation of the system is that these P4 uh, programs are limited in the amount of um, of headers that they can add onto a packet. Um, and so in some cases, for instance, I don't know, like if you want to uh, bump up a packet of 40 bytes to 1500 bytes, this would be very hard to do. Uh, so here, the solution, it's more of a hack uh, rather than a solution, but uh, is that you can also recirculate packets and then you can do the padding of these headers multiple times. So again, this calls for like an optimized patterns that where you don't have to do this bump from minimum to maximum too often, otherwise you do pay the price, of course. But yeah, absolutely, it's P4 based, and the P4 code is uh, available online. You can you can download it. Right. So you couldn't take multiple small packets and concatenate them together without significant performance loss. Yeah, correct. So this is something that, um, as far as I know, to the best of my knowledge, P4 does not allow you to do. Um, so. As I said, now we are thinking, of course, we, we, I mean, the motivation of this project is that, okay, we can do things now in P4 and hardware. Can we do this? And now we are hitting all these limitations that are kind of like preventing us from having this very nice curve, as I was saying. And one of them is, is, is the one you mentioned, right? So we, we have like heavy limitations on how we do the, um, how we do the padding. And so you could actually imagine uh, just having a next generation of programmable hardware that comes with um, I mean, either like the ability to put packets together. That would be tough, I think, because you need to buffer things, right? Uh, but also just with the ability to create kind of like um, a random amount of bits, stream of bits, and then to slap that on the packets that you can delete afterwards. And that is something, for instance, that would allow us to pad onto, I mean, arbitrary, up to arbitrary uh, sizes. Uh, without paying uh, such such a big price, uh, but for that you would need to modify the hardware. So now I'm talking about new ASIC designs, and that can take, as you know, like many many years. So um, yeah, that's that's the price to pay. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's more likely that this type of stuff might better be fitted for a smart NIC, which is what you would likely use in a wide area network uh, router anyhow. So using all these data center P4 switches uh, to do things for different uh, environments. Um, is, yeah, is yeah, of course. I mean, you're right that this is another alternative design. You can use the endpoints. You can use smart NICs also running in the host. Uh, one issue here is that if you are considering the endpoints generating traffic, 
it's very hard to guarantee uh, what will the traffic inside the network look like if you are creating your obfuscated traffic at the edge, because it depends on um, I mean, all the all the different queues and links and devices that you will cross before you you hit the link that is supposed to be obfuscated. So here the price that you need to pay if you go there is that you you really need to send a lot of traffic so that you guarantee that all the links are, are being full essentially all the time. And that we saw as a, as a kind of like limitation of endpoint based design. That said, you might imagine that smart NICs can help you um, kind of like giving you, let's say, base traffic that you can use to obfuscate a production traffic better. So instead of asking the smart NICs to obfuscate, you can ask the smart NICs to help you obfuscate in the switch and you just offload the bad operation to the smart NIC. So this would be a design, an hybrid design that we haven't considered, but I mean, could be interesting for sure to explore. All right. Um, just in the interest of time, let's have the next questions be relatively brief on discussion. Sure, yes. Yeah, sorry. Get to that. That's fine. No worries. Uh, Wes is next, I think. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah. It, thanks for the talk. It was, you know, fascinating to hear the, the, the issues of deploying constant bit rate type, you know, flows at scale. Um, can you speak to, you know, whether you do content management of flows before they go into Ditto? In other words, sort of the purpose of this workshop is really to talk about how to improve management and Ditto, you know, functionally is designed to, to prohibit that, which is fine. It's your own layers. But do you have any sort of prioritization that can go into your buffering layer? It looks like you only have, you know, size-based queues and, of course, the chaff-based queues, but nothing like, uh, you know, these flows are more important. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question indeed. The um, I mean, our goal was was not to try to um, let's say discriminate between different types of traffic. So we did not consider that. the The context we we assume is just we receive traffic in. We want to obfuscate everything. Uh, now that said, um, it's actually possible to do exactly what you said because since we the the that in this program, um, we can actually augment Ditto with classification uh, primitives or classification programs that would run before Ditto and would then adapt what flows are being uh, obfuscated or are not obfuscated. So you're absolutely not forced to obfuscate everything and you can do that selectively according to an arbitrary logic that you would need, of course, to, to define, but nothing prevents that in the hardware. All right. Thank you. Uh, Richard? Thanks. Just a couple of quick clarifying questions. Um, on the while you talked about applying a distribution to packet sizes, but I was wondering if you were also applying distributions to kind of other aspects of the packet flow, like things like interpacket timings. Um, so that was one quick, quick question. The other one was whether um, it seems like you could impose maybe any distribution here. If, you know, if I wanted my my military network to look like a corporate one, say, um, you know, it, it seems like that's possible, but um, at the cost of efficiency. So just wanted to confirm that intuition's right. Yeah, so let me let me answer the second one and then the first one, the uh, if I don't forget the first one by the time I've answered. Uh, but the your to answer your second question is indeed correct. So uh, you you are in, in control of whatever you want to leak out through your distribution. So um, if you if you want to avoid like making just the constant uniform distribution with all packet max size, you can indeed make your military network look like an enterprise network on ISP network. At the price of, of an overhead, so um, and and this is something that you have to decide. This is a design decision um, at this point. And then for the first question, if um, if I'm not mistaken, it was about why do we only look at packet sizes and not at packet timing in the distribution? It's because what we do is we really send. So how do we maintain constant timing in between packets is by ensuring that we always send at 100 gig. So we, we are always flat, uh, always flat there. So the distribution of the incoming packets timing does not really matter for us because at the end, it's all about um, being constant time by blasting the link out. Uh, what do matter, of course, is the size of the packet because this is where we have to pay the price in, in the padding, right? So this is why we care about the size and not the timing. If you want to run Ditto and not blast the link, then you would need to start looking at uh, exactly timing distribution. As you said, the big question is whether you can do that and still maintain the security. And that's that's an open question um, that we are thinking about, but it's uh, it's tough. It's a research challenge, I think, at that point. Thanks. Uh, uh, we I have think one last. 
Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask you that's okay. Um, so my question is sort of similar to what Richard was asking, but um, in terms of timing is, did you consider effectively, rather than sort of shaping the flow to get a repeating pattern, to instead just inject uh, sort of lower priority random sized packets in the flow when, it, when it's otherwise idle on the link, which would still sort of, I think, inject quite a lot of noise and different shapes in without doing quite as much as you're doing here? potentially still with extending some packets. So was that something you looked at or thought about um, or would that not give enough um, yeah. security in terms of what you're trying to achieve? Yeah, so we, we did not consider that directly, uh, but now that you mention it, of course, there could be a design that, that one could think about. I'm indeed thinking about the security of it, right? So as, as you said, like the big question then is if you have like a, an intermingle uh, between random traffic Random, randomly sized traffic that you generate, right? And then the production traffic somehow uh, mixed in that. You really need to be a, to be able to guarantee that there is no way to distinguish then the random traffic, uh, e in easier way than the production traffic or vice versa, right? Because I can just try to uh, discover the complement of what I'm looking for, and then I do the difference, and then I get I get the traffic, um, the, the production traffic out. So here again, the big question is how to do that uh, while guaranteeing security here. So here, the fact that we have a repeating pattern really enables to ensure that we don't leak anything. Um, if you have randomness into the mix, then the big question is how much randomness do you need? And this, I don't know, I don't have a good mental model of that. It depends on your input traffic, right? So um, I guess it's a, it's a network dependent um, question, um, but it's a good suggestion. Uh, we, we haven't considered it yet. Okay, thank you. All right, I think that takes us to the end for this one. Thank you so much for nice. sharing this talk. Sure. And then last today, um, I believe Mallory is gonna take us through yet a different perspective of kind of, you know, where we at in the, some of the discussions about user interest and user privacy. And then after that, um, I think the rest of the time will just be used on discussion and next steps. And Mallory, do you wanna share? I'm going to try. I'm not able to right. upload the presentation, but I can just use my preview window. Yeah. If that works yeah. for you. Yeah. That's great. Okay. You never know exactly what to do with about the view, but I'll improve that. Maybe that's a slight improvement. Okay. Um, yo, so thanks for um, having me present. Uh, this actually zooms out quite a bit from what uh, folks have presented today. So it's kind of a reminder of the where we're headed or what the intention is around um, user centric approaches to to measurement um, and so it doesn't necessarily speak directly to the issue of um, encrypted traffic but i do think that it so one of the things that i one of the reasons why i, I submitted it was i um, find often in talking about just encryption in general which is a, a really big part of my advocacy as um, staff member at the Center for Democracy and Technology is that um, the metadata versus content conversation happens quite a lot. Um, and so the I think you know, in the case of encrypted traffic where you have less access to the traffic itself, there's a tendency then to lean quite a bit on metadata, which is what a lot of folks have presented today. But there are good reasons maybe why one should exercise some restraint around that or to um, be a little bit more thoughtful um, in the approach to, to using metadata to make up for the fact that there isn't um, so much content available. So let's get into it. Um, these are just some of the um, reasons why we're taking this principled approach. There's a document that's in the privacy research group um, at the IRTF and it's um, sort of presents some guidelines for this. So this is really for any measurement, like I said, in any environment, um, if you're concerned about user safety, um, you should follow these guidelines. So again, not necessarily specific to encrypted systems. Um, it takes a user perspective, and I would say its biggest contribution in, um, in the text that's there is around data minimization. It goes into several different approaches to that. Um, I do recognize data minimization as a topic that's going forward in other parts of the IETF, but um, within the context of the safe measurement, it, it also reiterates that. Um, I, I wanted to point out, I made this point just a minute ago, but I wanted to say it 
really explicitly is the very act of detecting traffic or measuring it is itself a proliferation of data. So it does work at cross purposes with um, data minimization principles. And so where it, when it's done, um, especially in encrypted environments that are perhaps concerned about um, security and privacy and user safety, um, not enhancing the metadata, not proliferating that data um, would be, um, should be an explicit goal. So, and if you do, then what do you do about it? So this um, document talks um, a little bit about, about what to do. Um, you can you can link from here. These are in my slides that are uploaded. Um, but you know, there's an active internet draft. Um, discussion of this has been happening on the research group's list. Um, a review just came in the other day about this, so it's it's definitely an active um, topic of conversation. Um, and we're using GitHub to manage it. So if you have comments after this, you can you can go there. Um, the folks who started it actually was from um, folks at the Tor Project. Um, and then I've sort of been shepherding the document since it was more or less abandoned, but also Gershabad Grover, who actually isn't at CIS anymore. That's out of date. He's working at ONI, the, or UNI, the, the Open Observatory for Internet, uh, sorry, Network um, Measurement. Um, right. And so the goal of the document then, which I'll get into the structure um, relatively soon, is um, we really are hoping that uh, folks both in industry and academia noting that there's quite a lot of measurement of the network happening um, by third parties or, or folks who are interested in studying the network, that um, these measurements being used to research um, the use of the internet and et cetera, um, follow some guidelines just to ensure that um, those measurements can be carried out without violating user privacy. It's a document, for example, that we feel like could be useful when, um, you know, I guess ethics review boards are looking at you know academic studies that that measure network traffic. This could be a document that comes out of the IRTF um, that that sort of discusses this and should um, maybe inform um, the outcomes of a review board decision about about things. So that's one example example of use. I think another place where it could be useful is in industry when you are sort of making decisions around how to measure what to measure. Um, how you might consider informing consent. There is a whole section on consent um, where it makes sense and where it's possible. Obviously, if you're doing this on your own network for users that have already opted into your service, um, you've probably thought that through in terms of consent um, notifications or terms of service. But there may be cases where, um, you know, this is actually not necessarily your traffic and, and so measuring it and that sort of thing could have some um, implications for consent. So that's the overall goal of the document. Um, there are some important scope issues that we always um, are careful to disclose. Um, we 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 don't. I did mention ethics review, but it isn't a replacement for one. It should be informative of one and um, help influence that. Um, it's also not legal advice, even though it talks about things like consent in terms of service. Um, but it's also not um, restricted in scope. Um, just for um, the network. So it could also have um, implications elsewhere. So explicitly user traffic, for example. Um, and then we talk about internet users. And this is always a tricky one um, because I think that um, this is a really broad term. We, we talk about users as if they need to be engaged with the thing that they're doing and logged in and quote online and all of that. But we know increasingly that um, data about people is really what we mean. And so it may not be that you actually have a user for um, that's subscribed to your service for their data to be affected and for a person to be affected by it. So a person could maybe not even be um, you know, logged in or online for for their for their data to be implicated, and so we have to be, I think, specific what we mean by um, by internet user and, and and what it is and what it doesn't mean and what it does mean. Um, so those are the scoping issues around the draft. Um, so within that scope, we have a document with three parts essentially. Um, so the first one talks about consent. Um, and the the layers of that, um, literally, because you um, it, it may be a little too abstracted. So we've broken that into three different um, strata of consent. 
Um, there are safety considerations, which then um, actually are more like the guidance piece of this. So give some um, suggestions around how to do measurement in a way that doesn't um, implicate user privacy more than more than you have to, more than you need to. Um, and then there's a last and final piece that so far in this document is rather unexplored and unwritten. So, um, and just to also, yeah, restate, because it's an internet draft, it is a work in progress. Um, but I think the point of the risk analysis is to be able to do some decent amount of trade-offs when making various decisions around these other, um, these other pieces um, to be considered. Um, so um, I, I'm not going to go over the entire paper for you. Um, I, I think enough for discussion purposes I wanted to present. You can, of course, read it um, on your own time and, and give comments. Um, and so I might I may end up finishing finishing this presentation early, which I think is a good thing because I really is just meant to inform um, the, the larger discussion. So the the main pieces I'm going to talk about are the consent piece and the safety piece. So consent, um, there are three main um, approaches to consent that are somewhat agreed upon. Meaningful consent is a term that just tries to be specific about what that means. Um, and so the first is obviously um, informed consent. You're able to actually, um, you know, obtain obtain consent. So one example we use in the draft is, you know, a researcher um, uses volunteer owned mobile devices to collect information about local internet censorship. Um, and the connections will be made from the volunteer's device toward a known or suspected blocked web pages. So this is a case often when you actually are asking people to participate. You're, you're, you know, there's a specific reason why you're taking these measurements to find out something specific until you've asked people to participate, either by buying hardware or installing um, software or an add-on or something like that. Um, proxy consent. So this is probably the one where we're thinking about um, happening in the the terms of service, or you already have a user. But so this is where a, you know the example we give is a researcher performs packet capture to determine the TCP options and their values used by a client um, on a corporate wireless network. So proxy consent probably is not necessarily informed or um, explicit consent, but you can assume that consent exists because of the um, way you've designed the project. Um, and then the the implied consent is separate in that um, the example we give is here you're doing some a a b testing for a protocol feature on web performance. Um, so you have um, you've designed your telemetry to exclude the obvious stuff. And then beyond that, you're pushing updates to users at random. Um, and so you would just need to, um, as long as you're not implicating their data, um, that consent is implied because they've signed up for the auto updates, just to give some thoughts. Um, so then um, I'm going to go through then in the safety section, there are four separate um, subsections that talk about how to um, reduce risk to users um, or user data. Um, this one, this one is around test beds. And so um, this makes sense in in a place where you have something specific you want to find out. So it's not measuring all the traffic all the time. Um, you have, um, you know, a test bed essentially. So you, you put some parameters around that. And that's, I think, important. You can maybe find out um, changes or effects that changes to your network management are going to have by doing this without um, having to monitor all the all the traffic all the time. So it's something to consider. Um, the second one um, is more guidance to folks who are probably third parties and and this is not their infrastructure. Um, but if you are measuring um, the network for a variety of different reasons, there are going to be places where you would want to exercise some restraint around um, what other others infrastructure is doing. So I think that this is probably pretty common sense for folks, but it's worth stating because I think we sometimes forget that, you know, there are places where I think as Richard put it earlier, things are leaky um, and exploiting that for the purposes of one's experiment is maybe not um, all that, all that great of an approach. So, um, you know, just be mindful um, that you're tech you're technically on other people's infrastructure in that way, and um, 
and again to to think about restraint um there are this and this gets really tricky of course for for folks who are just sort of interested in you know what does the network look like um but then are crossing legal legal jurisdictions for example um and so that can be that can be a really difficult consideration so but but i think addressing that or trying to um mitigate it sooner rather than later is always um, a, a prudent approach um not just for you and whether or not you are um sort of breaking the law or doing something within legal boundaries but that, that your users and the data that you're measuring also is not um implicated that's probably the larger consideration right um okay there's then and of course these sections goes on they they go on and they, so if there's something in here that you haven't seen please do raise it but there might also it might also be there i've just not it's not made it into my summary um the the last one i think that i that i bring up in the context of the slides um is around minimizing data so this goes on to do four additional sub subsections and its approach to how um data minimization can be done um when you are again proliferating it creating it proliferating it when when you're when you're capturing data when you're taking measurements of it um so discarding data is always very nice don't keep it around it can be ephemeral you can learn something from it um, machines can learn something from it and then just get rid of it um, masking data is another approach so that um, you're not it's not just a fire hose um, you only need what you need um, and if you're going to keep it around you can um, certainly hide um, certain parts of it um, reducing accuracy is just um, you know to to minimize the ability to um, to target individual points on um, and there are obviously lots of techniques for that I don't have to detail them for you um, and then this is similar, I think, in the um, aggregation of data. So um, another approach um, to minimizing um, specific data about the folks that you're, folks traffic that you're measuring. M, risk. Like I said, the um, this section is rather unwritten, and I think the um, sort of the intention around here is to um, give folks interested in this topic, um, the ability to make trade-offs. Um, so it may, it's, I don't think it's redundant necessarily to the first two sections on consent and on safety mitigations, but I do think um, it's a necessary section. It's just difficult to um, so far know exactly what the guidance might be. So if folks have strong feelings about risk assessments um, and um, that please you know chime in we would appreciate your expertise on this so um, part of the reason why you know we of course wanted to have this conversation is to improve sort of the guidance that we're giving to others and this is a really great group um, to uh, to ask that of there um, so if you're interested in the direction of travel for this draft um, we do have some open issues that we know we need to include um, because this is maybe going to have implications for the ethics of, of measurement. We want to have something on uh, responsible disclosure of vulnerabilities, like say you're measuring something, you find out um, all is not well, how then do you approach it and what do you do um, in response? Um, we want to also think about um, availability as a, um, a risk um, or, you know, we don't also want folks to be losing data as well. That's another factor for um, cyber private cyber security um we haven't explicitly considered ip addresses which we um we might want to do there's guidance potentially on other forms of metadata that we could get more explicit about that's an open question um there are it doesn't also discuss like what um what measurement looks like in um uh, the future when computing capabilities are more um robust and then there's just a few here that are um like we need to make citations of of work that's like very obviously in this realm but isn't yet um cited or that those learnings aren't brought forward into the text which they should be um then then i would just say the last two pieces are the data minimization section i think is good in its skeletal form but it hasn't probably enough uh, guidance there as such yet 
Um, and then I, I already talked about how the risk assessment piece is unwritten, but I think still valuable. So I would be in favor of keeping it, but we don't have a lot there to talk about so far. Um, this just to remind you again, I, this was my first slide. It's kind of why we're taking this principled approach. Um, and I do, I do still think it's rather valuable. So, um, I don't need to go into the last slide. I'll just leave it here. Maybe if there are questions along these lines, or if anybody else wants to chime in with, um, feedback, I think I did actually go over time. Apologies. That's fine. Okay. Uh, um, we have time for one or two quick questions before we get to the more open discussion. If anyone has stuff. Q. Not seeing anything immediately. So thank you, Mallory. We can kind of wrap everything together now in the broader discussion. Um, and I'm just as you know, one point of order here. I think for the next two days, we're probably going to have you know a bit more of the broad open discussion. But today, since we're just kind of gathering, you know, what are the different uh, perspectives and stuff that we're coming from? I think we wanted to just hear more of these different angles. Um, so, you know, tomorrow we're going to talk about where we want to go, and then we're going to get into kind of like what are the different collaboration techniques of how we actually. Uh, improve uh, the relationship here between uh, network management and the encrypted traffic. But yeah, I'd like to just open the floor now for people to comment. Let's keep kind of the comments, you know, relatively succinctly. You know, let's try to keep it to five minutes or less, um, certainly um, for any given point here. But curious to hear people's thoughts synthesizing uh, the different angles we've heard today. Um, I can certainly chime in, but I'm happy for someone else to kick that off too. And we can just use the chat to queue up there. Michael. So uh, I thought that the, um, various, uh, flow, um, hidden hiding pieces were kind of interesting um, in the effort. Um, back about 15, 20 years ago, you know, um, people came to the IPSec working group and said, um, if you could just show us your TCP headers, we could do wonderful things for you. Um, and at the time around 2002 or something like this, um, you know, the group's attitude was pretty much show me the money. Um, and was like, okay, what are you going to do for us? Tell us what you can do. And and then there were various mutters about, you know, how it was proprietary secret 3G information and they couldn't tell us what they're going to do. And we were just all like, well, I, I think if you can't tell us what the benefit is, then I don't think we want to take the risk. Um, later on, the group, I guess, changed a bit and published, um, what was it, RFC 5840, which is the wrapped encapsulating security payload um which i would give a six pack of beer to anyone who could tell me it was actually ever deployed by anyone ever ever um and and i think that's a little bit telling to me that um we get lots of information of, from people that say if only i could see stuff then I could do things for you. And, and what I conclude, actually, the 3G people, and some of them were not 3G, actually, it was their proprietary solutions to what we now call buffer bloat, some kind of act pacing that they wanted to do um, to, to deal with the problem that actually they'd misdiagnosed, as Jim Geddes, you know, said that the 3G networks are massively buffer bloated. Um, and if, if, if they had recognized it, it or the IPsec working group had recognized that this is what they were really dealing with was a congestion problem, not a flow problem. And you really didn't need to see the headers. You just needed to eliminate buffers, right? Um, then, you know, we can have a better conversation. We could have said, well, no, actually, you're, you're completely misdiagnosing the problem. And maybe that's because you, you're misdiagnosing because you can't actually see what the traffic is. But um, 
you know, there's a lot there. There wasn't a lot of encrypted traffic on the network on that network to begin with. So it was kind of like a bit weird. But people were really, really concerned about about HTTPS everywhere and other stuff like this. Um, and so I think that um, I think that in large part that that um, there's actually lots and lots and lots of data as 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 the various presenters have said that you can get out of encrypted traffic if you want to get it. And sometimes it's a little bit harder, um, but I think actually that it's healthier because I think you're actually you have more certainty that you've actually um, uh, diagnosed the real problem rather than what it, were the symptoms, which was the window was too big. And I think that being able to see the window was a, a mistake. And I guess I'd also say that I think that one of the the, the failures. Um, caused by NAT 4.4 was the belief that your transport layer headers were not subject to wiretap. So um, I believe we should have encrypted them from the beginning and other people have said that as well. But I think from a legal standpoint that, you know, I don't know if it, non-Americans and I'm not an American, but I've read some of the stuff. There's these things called pen registries which is the old list of telephone numbers that the the um, operator would write down, right? When you phone somebody, they would write down what number you phoned uh, in order to bill you. And in that went into a, like as a different kind of a level of warrant. At some point, the police just walked into the telephone center and said, show, you, show me your pen registry. And there was no, no oversight at all. But they couldn't tap the line without a warrant. And I think that's a really important thing that we missed on the internet was that yeah you have to reveal your destination address to the routers and that's the pen registry but everything beyond layer three should have been sacrosanct and the fact that nat 44 essentially made us start allowing middle boxes to see them is actually part of where we went wrong right and we needed to we need to roll that part back and so i'm not that upset about you know quick making everything look that way i'm upset that we've basically wasted a bunch of bits on the wire to do it but but i actually think that's probably the right answer is that you just you don't need to see it and and that's all yeah all right thank you just trying to move us along thank you for your comments michael definitely agree um Charles? so i think first of all i'm i'm a little bit annoyed of of seeing this broad you know naming of network management for all these different things that's kind of uh, very uh, misleading, I think, right? So we had already, you know, much nicer term like per pass for a good amount of this, but obviously I think we should be cognizant of the opposite side when you do have enterprise networks where, um, you know, the, the traffic classification to figure out what's going on in the business is, is a real important thing. And um, I don't think we have uh, given that uh, a lot of thought in the IETF, but, Maybe a good starting point is to figure out, um, you know, how, how can we um, create different buckets of what's going on? And, you know, if if an application encrypts things so that they're not meant to be seen by the network, then they, 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 they shouldn't be seen. Right. So, I mean, doing exactly all these things, we've uh, I think uh, saw two very good presentations here. The first two ones, I think, is very important. But likewise, I think we, sh we should also uh, consider exactly what is the metadata we want to break out from um, the application payload um, when um, there is a valid um, you know, business need and it is not user privacy uh, that is um, required for them. So I, I, th I think really the, the scope of what we need to look into needs to become broader if, if we want to capture more broad um, use case requirements. And as, as, as Michael said, I think the the one thing we really need to distinguish is you know insight into <clears throat> what is happening on the application side from the insight about how do we deal with congestion right because um i think that's really at the risk of becoming worse and worse at this point in time the more we are um uh, removing um the transport header insight um and we still don't have good ways on a big aggregation point in the internet to easily figure out what are the badly performing flows um, that are taking, you know, unjustifiable amount of bandwidth away from others without having non-scalable per state uh, forwarding actions in them, right? And uh, I think that is still hitting us 
Um, a lot of service providers have been trying to do this through the application layer, which which is very misguided, right? So, I mean, uh, even 10 years ago, it was all these back then 3G network providers that had problems with the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, not because it was doing things that, you know, Hollywood was concerned about, but because they didn't really get congestion control well worked out. And that's still the case whenever, you know, people are reinventing transport protocols by themselves, uh, we're running into congestion issues, right? So really getting in, in the TSV work uh, more towards uh, manageable congestion control in a scalable fashion, I think is is really very much related to this because when we have worked that out much better than I think we have now, at that point in time, um, in the public internet, there is no need anymore, in my opinion, to spoof into traffic uh, for good reasons, right? Then it goes back to all the bad reasons that we know why we uh, are working against Perpass. Right. Um, I jumped in the queue next. Um, so, just kind of listening to all of these talks today. The first two touched on, you know, that is essentially the direction for passive classification and categorization um, is, you know, AI management here. And I, I definitely get that that's a natural direction if you're trying to just replace your existing passive classification. But, you know, very much concerns me as a direction because it really just plays into this arms race between the traffic and the classification here. Um, I think if we are resorting to kind of the AI ML models, we are assuming that the traffic doesn't want to be classified um, to a large degree um, and saying like, oh, you know, we need to pull this information out that's not otherwise available. Um, and if that's the case, I think we're just going to see more of the techniques like what Ditto is presenting of saying, you know, we can just make it harder and harder to analyze. And so it's going to end up in a bit of a dead end. Um, also, you know, if you're assuming that the traffic is hidden, then it brings up the concerns of that Mallory is bringing up about consent and you know what are you actually trying to show? Um, so when we get to the why, I think there's an you know, interesting question Richard brought up, you know, why are we trying to do this? Um, and one of the examples there was the, uh, you know, we need a classifier to be able to say, uh, we need to treat video traffic with low latency. Um, and I think like what Michael was pointing out uh, just a bit, little bit ago, you know, why not use other techniques to fix the latency and buffer bloat? Um, why not use explicit signals, right? So in the case of, uh, you know, video chat or low latency, those applications have a clear incentive to try to get better behavior. We have techniques like ECN and people are working on L4S now that are a much, much better way to achieve the goal that don't require classifiers. Um, so, you know, I, I know there are different reasons that networks want to identify traffic, but for cases like this, I want to just, you know, leave us with the thought of you know, why are the networks not just going all in on ECN and L4S if they're trying to give low latency, why would you even try to go the classifier route? All right, uh, Wes was next. Thanks, I mean, that was a great segue into, I think you and I were thinking along the same lines of, I think one of the problem faces that was sort of unexplored in today's uh, presentations that we need to consider over the course of the workshop is where is this boundary between traffic that needs to be encrypted at some level, uh, but can still allow for analysis and determining, you know, what type of traffic there is needed for QS prioritization versus traffic that truly wants and needs to be entirely hidden for whatever reasons, good or bad. Um, you know, I doubt that anybody would mind being put into a priority key queue, even when accidentally, you know, but how do we ensure that we get sort of this, that maximum chance of being put into the right queue uh, when we still otherwise want to let everything else remain unknown? Um, and in, in other cases, you know, there are things like Tor that actually much better protect your privacy that are well worth using at the expense of latency. So how do we boundary, you know, how do we, um, bound these two types of use cases and specifically how do we offer these choices to the end user in a way that they can understand it without harming their priority excuse me they're harming their priority har harming their their privacy right so thank you all right 
Uh, I believe Nalini is next. Thank you. Sure. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think what somebody had made the point about um, needing the authority. I mean, who's entitled to see this data? Because I'm going to speak from the point of view of large um, private managed enterprise networks, and and I'm going to tell you that. Um, you know, we have requirements for fraud monitoring, malware detection, not passing out personally identifiable health data. These are even regulated, you know, regulated industry. And so, so completely understand the privacy requirements, but, but I want to make sure that, that if we don't have the the ability to manage our networks and meet the regulatory and other requirements, some of these things are just flat out not going to be used on our networks. So we need an you know we need an entitlement. You know it's like who can and should be able to see this data unencrypted. I don't see anyone else in queue currently. There's definitely a lot of chat going on in the WebEx chat. Anyone want to speak up? We've got about eight minutes left today. Well, and since we have, since we have time to kill, I'll, oh. I'll um, up level some of my comments from the chat in, into real time. Um, Please kill our time. Yes. Yeah. So, like the, the talk, I would love to see in general from some network operators is, you know, I think a lot of folks, I'll include myself in this, uh, who live up in the application layer, kind of have this idea that the network delivers my packets. It's it's just kind of a pipe. It's just there. It's not applying any intelligence. And I think the folks in the network side know that there's actual intelligence. The network is trying to provide some value, and so there's this kind of disconnect as to the way the application level folks think of the network. You know, if you come from that application point of view, it seems obvious that you can just encrypt everything because you're not losing any value because the network's not providing you any value. So I, I think, you know, I would love to see the talk from the network provider side about what value um, the network operators think they can provide by understanding more about um, application traffic. Um, uh, as I'll, I'll, I'll rant about a bit tomorrow, you know, I think we need to articulate the user level uh, benefits of these things, you know, the, the application level benefits of, of these network layer changes. Um, but I, I think that would be a, a useful kind of substrate on which to have these discussions to, to you know, to articulate the, the benefit side if we review we, we the, you know, exposing more information, leaking more information as a cost, you know, we need to understand what the benefit side of that equation is as well, so that we can make, you know, we as, um, with my application developer hat on, we can make intelligent decisions as to whether, um, and, you know, application developer hat, uh, and also we as kind of the, the internet standards community can make intelligent decisions about, you know, what trade-offs uh, make sense in terms of exposing more information versus, um, you know, keeping things private. All right. Uh, I think we have Wes and then Mario back in the queue. Uh, thanks. So, you know, one of the other places that I don't think we've explored, it just feels a little bit almost on the borderline of scope and not, is we haven't talked about sort of how to deal with discussions of user privacy within managed networks like corporate networks, where uh, they quite possibly have control over a lot of your privacy. Uh, so for things like, you know, forced installment of CAs or software and things like that, that actually allows sniffing of user behavior. Um, I certainly talked to somebody uh, 10 years ago, at least when Facebook was just spinning up and rather than um, uh, rather than tell the users that they shouldn't use Facebook on their corporate machines, they actually were just sniffing it and then logging in and using, you know, browsing their account um, after hours and things like that. Then that's how the user got tipped off is because they were logged in when they shouldn't have been. Um, and so it brings up very interesting cases. And I don't know how to deal with privacy in those cases where the corporate really does allow, you know, they, they have uh, essentially control and authorized control because that's your agreement for working there. Um, but to do that without without letting the user know that, that they might be harmed privacy-wise in some ways also seems equally as problematic. 
Maria, and then I think I'm going to cut the queue here. Yeah, I wanted to um, react to Richard's um, comment, and it's not like I'm dis dis disagreeing, but I think it takes very one sided view, right? So it's it's not that like the application is encrypting everything and now the it's on the network operators to show that there's some benefit in doing something differently. There are also cases where the applications actually cannot infer the information they want to optimize the traffic. And one of the chats example is, for example, in mobile networks, um, you can suddenly have more bandwidth available. And if you have any kind of uh, video or whatever, it's hard for you to scale up because you don't know how long will, will it be available? Should you actually scale up? How much more is available? Whatever. So you would need to send some kind of whatever fake training or whatever to figure out how much bandwidth is there and when you can scale up and when you change your audio coding or whatever. So this is a known problem where you can actually could like get information from the network that, that could help you. Um, so I think it's really a collaborative approach where like both sides need to sit together and figure out like where is it most beneficial to do something and how can we and how can we work together on that? That's that's all I wanted to say. All right, Jason. Just in response to the question about um, network operators and some of the things, uh, a pretty large number of um, our customers at Comcast opt into a sort of managed home network where they might turn on parental controls um, for their kids. As an example, it might be time of day based or it may be destination or application or type of content based. And so you really can only derive that if you can see the FQDN. Um, and to the extent that, you know, so Doe to some extent, you know, disrupted that, you know, ECH will, you know, become uh, a bigger problem, obviously. So there's a lot of um, of that uh, being used. And then people that aren't using parental controls want to have things like malware, ransomware types of protection. And again, you know, that's derived from well-known FQDNs of malware and CNC servers. And so, you know, that's a way to do that at the network layer. Um, and some users also go and, and want to prioritize for particular devices, certain classes of application, and you know, that's sort of another thing. But really the biggest use case is sort of that parental control and malware, you know, security type of protection. And oftentimes the answer is, well, like, oh, you know, it just has to happen on the endpoint then. And the problem ends up being that, okay, then you end up with an ecosystem of really three plausible providers of Microsoft, Google, and um, Apple. And number one, that's probably not satisfactory from the standpoint of centralization, but for users, they have very mixed environments. And then they have lots of IoT and other things um, which may not have the ability to be managed at that endpoint. And so therefore, you know, some management point in the in their homeland um, that they control is a better um, point as an example and then just one last comment you know within the operator network it's helpful to generally know you know what are the destinations um, what are the general types of application class because it can make uh, make you sort of change network planning decisions you know at a very very high level thanks All right, thank you i think uh, some of your points about filtering are relevant to other topics we'll have later this week. And last we have Paul, and then we're gonna wrap up. Um, I, I was just gonna, well, the discussion has kind of moved on, um, but I was just gonna echo what Wes said about privacy in managed networks. Um, I, I think like this is a very interesting topic that hasn't received enough like attention. Um, and just as one data point, uh, my mom recently got a new job um, and she, her job is like a bring your own device company. And so she just uses her personal laptop for work purposes. And I think this kind of bring your own device is increasingly common. And so I think we have to reflect on what it means for non enterprise privacy. Like it seems like in bring your own device, there's a really important uh, uh, bleed over for like personal privacy that doesn't have to do with enterprise networks. If you're using your home computer right like if you install some monitoring thing on it then the company just knows everything you're doing all the time um so yeah i i i i didn't have a conclusion there i just wanted to also add another data point that's good all right thank you so that brings us to the top of the hour and we're out of time but um 
thank you for everyone who presented or who commented today and just for listening and thinking about this. We're going to carry on tomorrow and Wednesday with more discussion. Um, and I'm looking forward to kind of exploring more of those directions for how we go forward from here. Thank you all. Thanks, Tommy. Bye.